I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. And for today's episode, guys, we're talking about the history of the G-Men. No, I'm not talking about the, the New York Giants, as how Chris Berman refers to them. I'm talking about the FBI. We're talking about the FBI today. Guys, if you're looking for something good to read, if you need a new book in your life, uh, might I recommend this one right here, Killers of the Flower Moon. That's what I'm reading right now, and uh, it's quite good, and it's actually a true story on top of that. I haven't finished the book yet. I'm only about halfway through, as you can see, but it is a, it's a really, really good read, and I noticed something when I started reading it. On the cover of the book, it says right here, The Birth of the FBI, and I saw that, and I was reading it, and I said, Sh I haven't talked about the FBI and its origin story, how it got started yet. I tell you, man, you, you, you do 70 episodes of a show like this, you think, you've, <laughs> you think you've covered everything. Not the case. So the FBI, you guys know them, right? It's that corrupt government agency that's responsible for high-profile assassinations, government takeovers, government coups around the world, and a slew of other shady dealings that Americans can't even begin to fathom the depths of. And Oh, wait. Is that... Hang on. Is that the CIA or the, the FBI? It's the CIA. That's CIA, right? It's, it's got, yeah, it's the CIA. I'm sorry, I get those confused. Hang on, sorry, I shut my phone off. It is... It's... Okay, that, how, wait, how did they text? Um, okay. So let's dive into this origin story, man. Let's look at the beginning of the FBI, how it got started, and I'll give you a hint as to how it got started. It has to do with a man whose last name was Bonaparte. So we kick off the story way back in 1865 when a group was formed by the Treasury Department that you all know very well, it's still around today. They're called the Secret Service. Now at the time, the Secret Service's job was not to protect the president. At the time, there their job was to investigate crimes uh, like counterfeiting uh, and fraud. But by 1870, a larger branch of federal law enforcement was created, and it's still around today. It's called the Department of Justice. But here's the thing about the DOJ when it got started. They didn't have their own investigators, right? They had to borrow guys from the Secret Service, and they had to hire private detectives uh, to do their investigating for them. But the thing is, is the Department of Justice couldn't continue to operate like this, they needed to squad up. They needed to get their own guys. Because you have to remember, guys, that by the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, the United States is growing quite rapidly. Railroads are connecting the country from one end to the other. Cities and towns are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, uh, the Model T is rolling out of the Ford factory, which means people can now use cars also as getaway vehicles. So there are a lot more crimes happening around the country as the population continues to grow. And in 1901, when Teddy Roosevelt became president after his his predecessor, William McKinley, was assassinated, uh, he wanted to sort of reform law enforcement at the federal level because you have to remember Teddy Roosevelt used to be a, a commissioner of the New York City Police Department. So he's got kind of a hard on for, for law enforcement. So to pull off this reform of federal law enforcement, in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt brings on as attorney general a man by the name of Charles Bonaparte. And if that last name is familiar, it's because it is the same last name of Napoleon Bonaparte. And yes, just to get ahead of you, Charles Bonaparte was related to Napoleon. He was his grandnephew. But Charles Bonaparte wasn't born in France. He was born in the United States. He was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and he started off his career as a political activist and then later would become an attorney. And then he would rise through the ranks. He would become the, uh, the Secretary of the Navy and then would eventually become Roosevelt's uh, Attorney General. So the two men, Roosevelt and Bonaparte, decided that an agency had to be created to enforce federal law. But here's the thing. Bonaparte made it clear to Roosevelt that he did not have investigators at his disposal. Who is going to who is going to carry out these investigations uh, for this new agency? Because Bonaparte, when he was trying to start this agency, was still borrowing guys from the Secret Service and still hiring private detectives. But hiring private detectives was too expensive, and when he would use guys from the Secret Service, they wouldn't report back to him with their findings. They would report back to their boss, the head of the Secret Service. And then on top of that, in 1908, Congress declared that Secret Service agents could not be used by any other federal Federal department. They had to stay within the Secret Service, which now meant that Bonaparte had nobody available to him. So 
he had to take matters into his own hands. Here's what he did. He took nine Secret Service agents that he had used regularly on previous investigations and he hired them for his own agency. Took them away from the Secret Service and said, here, you come work with me. I have a new job for you. It's going to be awesome. He would also hire 25 additional agents, which meant that these 34 agents would be the first agents of a new law enforcement agency investigating crimes for the Department of Justice. And this agency came into being on July 26, 1908, which is why July 26 is to this day known as the birthday uh, of the FBI. Even though when it first started, it wasn't called the FBI. As a matter of fact, they didn't have a name uh, until 1909 when the uh, when the new Attorney General, after Charles Bonaparte, George Wickersham, called it the Bureau of Investigation. So what did the early agents of the BI investigate? Well, according to the FBI's website, it said that these new agents focused on, quote, mostly white collar and civil rights cases, including antitrust, land fraud, banking fraud, naturalization and copyright violations, and forced labor. However, in addition to all those responsibilities, the Bureau would also take point on certain larger cases like in 1910 with the Mann Act, which helped to stop human trafficking and prostitution across state lines. And by 1915, the Bureau would grow exponentially from the 34 agents it originally started with to having over 300 people in its employ, and its net would be cast even wider, all thanks to World War I. In 1917, when America entered World War I, the BI was given more responsibility. They were responsible for uh, for finding and nabbing people that were deserting from the army. Uh, they were finding, quote unquote, uh, enemy agents, aka Germans that were in the United States, but, uh, but they didn't have United States citizenship. And they also had to protect the country from acts of sabotage. So thanks to the Espionage Act, that was passed by Congress in 1917, the Bureau made its first forays into the spy business. Additionally, in 1917, a young man by the name of J. Edgar Hoover gets a job at the Bureau, serving as the personal assistant to the Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer. And one of Hoover's first big splashes in the Bureau was to take point on something that was known as the quote-unquote Red Scare, which took place between 1919 and 1920. What Hoover did was he basically created uh, this huge catalog of people that he thought were uh, radical leaders, uh, people that were uh, supporting the Bolshevik uprising in Russia that was happening during World War One. So he catalogs all these people. He makes files and dossiers of all these people that he thinks are radical leaders, uh, radical organizations, radical publications. He, he assembles this huge, huge catalog of all these people and all these organizations, and it leads the, uh, the Attorney General to go out and try to find these people, find these organizations, and place them under arrest. And these raids would become known as the Palmer raids. But see, here's the thing about these raids, didn't actually pan out the way that Palmer and Hoover thought they would see, because what happened was during these raids, around 10,000 people were arrested in the United States for supposedly having communist ties or, or being sympathetic to the communist uh, regime in, uh, in Russia, in the Soviet Union. But a lot of times these people would just be arrested, they would be detained for a little bit, and then they would just be let go. So the Palmer raids were kind of seen as a stain on the Bureau of Investigation, and on top of that, because of the failure of these raids, Congress looked at A. Mitchell Palmer and were like, you are running a bit wild with, with, with that power of yours over there. You might want to pump your brakes a little bit because that ain't, that ain't cool, man. And so while Palmer was getting criticized over and over again by Congress, Hoover walked away from the Palmer raids unscathed. He kept his job in the Bureau of Investigation. As a matter of fact, by 1924, Hoover would be promoted to the director of the Bureau of Investigation, and he would become its most famous slash infamous director. And the Bureau, under the direction of this paranoid little man, underwent incredible drastic changes. For starters, Hoover, when he became director, he cleaned house. Any agents that he thought weren't doing their job well enough, got rid of him. He's like, you gotta go, you're not doing anything for me. On top of that, Hoover would also bring about like, th these incredible new additions to the FBI, like for example, the idea of fingerprint identification, uh, an FBI crime lab, and he would start a training school for potential agents. And then in 1935, Hoover would give the BI, the Bureau of Investigation, a brand new moniker. The Bureau of Investigation would then be known forevermore as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. Now, as much as I would love to dive into all the sh that J. Edgar Hoover did when he was director of the FBI for five decades, I'm not gonna do that on this episode because that I think that kind of, J. Edgar deserves his own episode. I'm not gonna dive into all the stuff that he did. And again, guys, don't get the FBI confused with the CIA. They're their own agencies, their own distinct uh, uh, agendas, their own distinct personalities, and... 
Sorry, I thought I shut my phone off. And I, I mean, I, I, I guess we could we could talk about the history of the the CIA next week. I guess I be. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Then I, I guess we're uh, we're talking about the history of the the CIA on next week. So it looks like this is a two parter, guys. CIA next week. I'm so glad I came up with that idea all by myself. <laughs> Don't hurt me. And that is it for this episode of US 101, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me this week. Really do appreciate it. And uh, guys, we just passed a major milestone on US 101. We surpassed 5,000 subscribers. Woo! Can't thank you guys uh, enough. For, uh, for, for your support of the show, for subscribing to the channel, and uh, for showing an interest in American history. Honestly, I didn't think that we would ever get to this point, and yet here we are, man. So next goal, 7,500, 10,000, 20,000. Let's just keep growing the channel, man. And we grow the channel thanks to all of you guys for liking the videos, for sharing them, for subscribing, for leaving comments in the videos, man. It's, it's because of you that, uh, that this channel continues to grow, that the videos continue to be seen by more and more people, guys. You guys are the ones that make this exist. You can follow US 101 guys, of course, on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, patreon.com slash US 101. If you guys want to pledge some money to the show so that we can help to uh, to grow the show, grow the channel, buy some new equipment, and you guys get some cool rewards, including a US 101 pint glass that uh, you can go ahead and get at Patreon, or you can go ahead and order separately over at classicetching.com. That link is down below in the description box. And I'll see you guys next Tuesday for an all new episode of US 101. Until then, I am all done. Uh, I've never done a two-parter on US 101. FBI one week, CIA next week. Not that I'm doing the CIA because anyone's forcing me to, to do it. I, I thought of it myself. I'm capable of independent thought. I can do these things.